Hello everybody, thanks ever so much for joining us uh, for the third of our uh, webinars about marketing the library. I'm Chris Stetson from a company called Creative Concern. I've seen some familiar faces around, I've seen some of you before. And uh, we are an agency that specialises in helping charities, not-for-profit organisations and the public sector communicate and deliver more effective uh, campaigns and brands. And um, I'll I'm with you for the next sort of hour and a half. There's probably about roughly about an hour of um, uh, presenting, maybe slightly less, and there'll be plenty of time for uh, discussions and questions. And um, we can either use the the chat function for that, um, or the raise the hand function on Zoom. Although for some reason my Zoom doesn't seem to be seeing people's hands raise at the moment, but uh, with the support of Edward, we will we'll muddle through and uh, make it work for you so i'm going to start uh, screen sharing and then um i'm going to get stuck in so just bear with me so stick I'm hoping you can just see one screen rather than two. Is that right, Edward? Just, just to double check. Yeah, that is. That looks good to me. Yeah, I can see one. Yeah, smashing. Okay, let's let's get stuck in. So, um, yeah, thank you to, to Libraries Connected for uh, asking us to deliver this uh, uh, webinar for you. And it's all about campaign performance is the focus this time. And just quickly in terms of uh, creative concerns, we're a full service uh, communications company. We do lots of different things. We've been working um, in this sector nearly for 20 years. So we've seen lots of campaigns come and go. Some have been successful, some haven't been successful. And we've learned our lessons from that. So today I'm going to try my best. There's a little bit of marketing speak. But I'm going to try and keep this um, as straightforward as possible. I think that's generally a good rule for communications anyway um and but there will be time for as i say further discussion and, and questions which in, on the last two uh, sessions have been probably the most positive and kind of interactive bit really so if you do have any questions during the presentation by all means jot them down and hopefully we'll get to them towards the, the end of the session in terms of what we are covering today this is the broad sort of outline for it um sorry i'm just Struggling a bit there. It just uh, looks like that has gone black. Has that gone black? Or is it just me? Are you seeing a, 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 a white screen or a black screen there? A black screen. Mm. Okie dokie. Bear with me. That's very odd. I could see it gone black, but it shouldn't have gone black. Hang on a sec. Uh, da -da -da -da. The joys of the Zoom. Just bear with me. I'm just going to try and. Uh, work out what's going on here. So. Is that better? Just checking you can see a screen now. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Great. Yeah, okay. Let me just... It's not quite playing today for me, but this, this we'll, we'll work this out. We'll work this out. Okay. So let me just see if I can. A bit better. Fine. Okay. So yeah, today we are looking at particularly campaign performance. So measuring performance, why that matters. Um, looking at how to define what matters for your organisation. Uh, setting your own goals looking at what can and can't be measured, uh, a little bit about return on investment and some, giving you some advice in terms of what tools can help. And then also looking at kind of how to adapt your approach if something isn't working. And also once you do have an audience that's engaged and interested, uh, what, what do you do then? You know, how can you kind of keep the momentum going? So first off, why measuring performance matters? And um, it might be kind of obvious, but I think sometimes it's important to state the obvious. So. Um, it helps ensure you are spending your budget wisely. That's the critical thing. Anybody who's got any sort of marketing spend will often be asked by somebody, well, was, was it worth the investment? Particularly if you're looking to increase that investment and increase the budget requests in the future. So um, measuring performance does really help in, in terms of that budget spend. So therefore it can help you build a case for support and further investment in the future. 
but also by measuring what works, it really does increase the chances of future success. Hi. So you can see what's working um, and what's not. Mm. It looks like we've got a bit of background noise. I don't know if folks can put them themselves yeah. on. <laughs> Find that very strange. Okay. I'm just hearing a bit. Of, I'm just seeing if I can. Uh, just gonna mute folks for now. Okay. Hopefully, you can still hear me. Okay. I've just put people on mute. Um, so yeah, it can help you build a case for support and allows you to learn from your successes or failures. So that's why it's important to measure. And I think the challenge really, the challenge for, for us all is that it's always, it's never as interesting or as enjoyable as planning a new campaign. So measuring performance does take a bit of effort and um, it's not the mo always the most interesting part of the project, but hopefully in this webinar, I'll give you some advice in terms of making it easier on yourself and actually, once you get into being able to measure performance, it is kind of it is an enjoyable part of the process and it's not quite as complicated as you think. So once you get things set up right, it makes it a lot easier. And then the other thing is that not every campaign is going to work and that that's OK. I think the important thing is what do you learn from what doesn't work uh, for the next campaign? How does that inform the next decisions, really? So this is one of the um, one of the most famous marketing quotes of all time. Half of the money I spend on advertising is wasted and the trouble is I don't know which half. And I think the great thing now, actually, in terms of particularly the rise of digital marketing communications is that that is not a lot less likely to be said and to be believed. And I think that actually in the past, potentially advertising got a bad name because of quotes like this. But actually, the great thing, particularly about social media and online, not it's all about that but it's certainly made the process of measuring effectiveness and seeing what's going on a lot easier than it used to be if you were just reliant on outdoor advertising or advertising in, in newspapers. So hopefully that's, that's a thing of the past. So how, moving on to how to define what matters to your organisation. What I mean by that is in terms of the campaign that you're, any sort of marketing campaign that you're looking to run, it needs to link back to what you're trying to achieve as a whole organization or as a whole service and i think that's always a good starting point when you're looking at performance to can link back to that so that might be a case of going you know back to your actual business plan it might be a case of thinking about what your mission vision and values are and how they are connected in some way to the marketing or communications exercise you're about to run it might be back to your, your communications plan or marketing plan if you have one it might be that your campaign is in um, response to a particular political environment or a particular issue. Um, sometimes a gut feeling comes into play as well on this. And also it might be about customer feedback. You might be launching a campaign in response to something either positive or negative that you've ha had in terms of customer feedback. So these things are things to consider when you're trying to come up with um, objectives for your campaign, which is an important part of measuring the performance so when you're looking at those things um fit, try and keep them as smart as possible so specific measurable achievable relevant time bound these are quite common things that you've probably come across before so if you're thinking about the big overarching objectives uh, for a campaign uh, which you can then measure against keep this in mind to keep it being as specific as possible as measurable make sure you can track it make sure it's achievable that you're going for something that's actually realistic keep it relevant and give it a time frame as well. So some smart objectives are really important. Then in terms of, so this is, so you, you've then got your overarching objectives for the campaign. So then in terms of setting your own marketing goals within that, um, there's a few things to keep in mind. So, you know, where do, where do you start? How do I know what's realistic? So this is often uh, a question we get asked that um, if we're gonna run a, a marketing campaign or a communications exercise, you know, how do I, measure my performance how do I know what's realistic what sort of goals should I set myself so I think the first thing to say around that is that what's important is to start with what you know already so if you're looking to launch a new marketing activity do you have any other campaigns to benchmark it against have you tried anything else so I think previous campaigns are one of the best ways to start when you're trying to set yourself 
and the specific measurable targets for your campaign. So look back at if you're doing a new campaign for the autumn season, for example, you know, how have you done previously? What, how have other marketing drives um, performed? That's a really good starting point. And also, do you have any peers within the sector? Obviously, Libraries Connected brings together a lot of different partners working in the similar circles. Can they share any information? So if you're looking to um, give yourself some targets to set yourself against, has any of your library partners or other public sector partners done anything similar to this in the past that you can measure yourself against? And also, you might well have some existing um, data and information about how well a particular audience normally responds to things. So you might have normal things like what your normal website traffic is like, or what your email response to email marketing is like, or what attendance at events is like in normal activity. So that, that kind of normal activity outside of your new campaign is still helpful because it influences how you can set targets and objectives. It's all part of it. In terms of benchmarks, there are things, there are industry benchmarks out there um, that people sometimes use to benchmark themselves against on their, um, their marketing campaigns. I personally don't think that that's a particularly useful thing to do. So the trouble is with that is that industry benchmarks are really based on often the entire economy. So for example, if you were looking to sort of say, well, um, how well should our, our campaign do on social media? For, for our particular library service, and you look out to the entire uh, marketplace, you'll be compared against all sorts of different brands, high street brands, all kinds of different initiatives. And so that often what uh, industry benchmarks do is they take all of that information and they just give you an average and say, well, on average, this percentage of people might respond to a social media campaign or a Facebook campaign, but how, relevant is that really to you so i would steer clear personally in terms of average industry benchmarks because i just don't think they really tell you enough uh, because they don't tell you about what other things are going on so just the example on the screen there that you might launch a campaign and you might be compared to say the performance that marks and spencers might have now they've launched you know a hundred million pound tv campaign at the same time so actually how they perform on social media is heavily influenced by all the other activity they're doing. So it's just an example to say that actually average industry benchmarks for the performance of campaigns aren't always that useful. And that really the only reliable benchmark is yourself and your immediate peers. So the best thing to do in terms of um, building a, a benchmark for the performance of your marketing or communications is to look at what you have done um, as an organisation and to set your benchmark based on that or your very immediate peers. So if you know that you that um, somebody that you know in your network has done something similar, a similar scale, then by all means, see if you can use that data to inform your campaign. But I wouldn't look at industry benchmarks. I just don't think they tell you anything particularly reliable. In terms of um, measurement, uh, what to measure, in terms of what to measure when you're looking at performance is a, is a critical part of, of this. And I think some things that are harder to measure first, before we go on to the things that are easier to measure, are often the things that people are actually asked to do through their campaign. So it will, things like we need to raise awareness of our service or offer. Measuring the raising of awareness is tough. Uh, it's tough unless you've got quite a considerable amount of money to put into uh, the analysis and the research. So it's not to say that it's not important, but it's to say that it's not always the easiest thing to do and to be, there are often easier measures to pick and choose from. The same that again, people are often wanting to launch campaigns to change people's perceptions of a brand or an organization or a service. And again, thinking of to, to the end of your campaign and measuring it, measuring changes of perception are tough they're tough without quite a lot of market research and quite a lot of expenditure another thing that people often have as an objective in their campaign is we want people to think about make people think about a particular thing or make people think about a new issue and again that is a tough one to measure as is increasing profile so again you might find that when you you're, have a particular brief or you're being asked to look at a campaign someone will say what we need to do is increase our profile with a particular audience but actually, again, measuring profile uh, in itself 
is tough without a lot of investment. So what I what encourage you to do is to try and think about some measures that are much easier um, to track. So what might, might those be? And it's not that you're ignoring the, those bigger questions, it's just that these are things that, co that contribute to that. So, um, and are much easier to measure and to set goals around. So for example, things like the number of new inquiries that a campaign might generate, the number of new signups sign for a newsletter, and that could be a, you could then set a percentage increase per month to have in, within that. The number of unique website visitors, Again, something that's very measurable. You can look at what your current website traffic is and then what it jumped up to, hopefully, if you did deliver the campaign. So you can measure that. Average engagement rates as well on social media platforms. And I'll cover some of this in a little bit more detail. So that, again, that's a numerical um, score. And it's something that you can track and see develop over time. Same with the number of followers on social media the number or value of donations, if it's a donation-based um, activity that you're doing, or the number of new members. So I would urge you when you're uh, setting up um, a campaign, you want to track uh, performance and see how well a campaign's gone. I would focus on the, the, the more easier, easier ones to measure compared to these tougher ones, just because it's gonna be much more difficult to prove. It might be that overall, what you're trying to do is change perceptions, but how you actually track that is through some other measures. So top tips in terms of setting goals or performance measures for your campaign. I'd first off, I'd say choose a small number uh, for your campaign, ideally one lead measure and maybe one or two secondary ones. Um, just because it allows you then to have some real focus, the more things that you're trying to um, encourage people to act upon, the more difficult it might be to keep focus on the campaign, and the more difficult it will be at the end when you're sort of reporting back and, and measuring how the performance has gone. So I'd, I'd try and keep one big ticket item as the big thing you want to achieve that you're going to measure and a couple of secondary things as well, maybe. And it's always good, to, if you can, to estimate your performance before you start to give yourself some targets. And, you know, as I said, if you haven't got industry benchmarks, the thing you're going to have, you're going to have to do some estimating based on the knowledge of your own organisation, how well your communications tools normally yeah. perform. And you might have to use some sort of crude maths to do some of that estimating before you, before you start a campaign. Okay. Now, just when I say crude maths, I'll just quickly explain. Okay. Let's get a little bit more. Yeah, background noise is seeing if I can mute people. Okay, so yeah, some example of some crude math. So if you're trying to, to do an estimate at the beginning of a, um, a campaign plan of what your performance might be, um, here's just a sort of basic way that you might be able to look at that in terms of if it was particular, if it was an email campaign, for example. So say you were going to um, email 1,000 people, you can probably make a judgment about how many of those people will read that email. And you can either do that just on your gut feeling, or you can look at um, previous e email campaigns that you've had, and it should have an open rate for the number of people that have actually opened and therefore kind of could have read some of that email. So you might say, well, 30% of them could read the email. So you're down to sort of 300 people then. Then in terms of, you could then make an estimate around the number of people that might act on the content that's in that email. So you might say, well, the 20% of people that have read the email might then go on to take an action as a result of that. So it brings you down to sort of say 60 people. Um, and then it might be that a small number of the, those people then take the actual action that you want them to take, whatever that action might be. It might be to sign up to something else, or it might be to go a particular place online or do some other activity. So then you can base, make another, another judgment on what percentage of people you estimate will take that action. And then you start to have a goal that you can actually work with. And then you can you know, escalate that up in terms of numbers if you need to. So it's just a quick example of how some, some bit of rational thinking, a little bit of insight from previous campaigns can start on the journey of setting yourself a goal to sort of say, right, well, we want this many people to take this action and we're going to use email as in this example to do that. So that kind of crude estimates 
does build up then um, a series of things that you can target within your campaign and, and some objectives to work to. In terms of measuring performance, the other thing is, is that obviously there's different sorts of uh, information that you might be able to accumulate. And I'm sure many of you have heard of the quantitative and qualitative data. And I think it's just to say that both of those things are important. So you might well, the quantitative stuff, the sort of hard numbers, the data, the percentage increases and decreases. Um, and we'll talk through some of the tools and you can gather this information. But that is uh, certainly super important. It's getting easier and easier to get those numbers, as I've said already, in terms of using online methods and social media. So all of that stuff is important, but it shouldn't be, that shouldn't be, um, that data should be gathered at the expense of the qualitative stuff. So it might well be that you can also undertake some interviews to get a bit of feedback about how the campaign went. You might run some focus groups about it. Uh, you might just get some informal feedback that um, people that run your library service, or you might get an email, you might get some comments. So all I'd say is that when you're doing um, a review and looking at performance of how a campaign has gone, try and get a mixture and a blend of the two. If you can get a blend of the two, it's much richer um, because often the, the numbers will only tell you so much. So if there is a way of getting some qualitative feedback as well, um, that's really good. And that really makes a strong evaluation, I think, is trying to get that kind of human voice as well as the hard facts and figures in as well. OK, so next up, in terms of some specifics around measuring performance, what tools are there to help? And again, many of you will have heard some of these, but I want some even some of the obvious stuff, I think, is still important. So I want to cover it, cover it all here. So the first one, and most of this is going to be focused on digital, cap, digital campaigns, because my uh, understanding is that the most likely thing that you'll be undertaking. I can certainly take questions about non-digital communications and how you might evaluate that at the end. But the first one uh, in terms of any sort of digital campaign is it might well be connected to a website. And if it is connected to a website, then Google Analytics is amazingly good in terms of giving you information about your audience, about what they're doing online, about how, they're, how your website is performing and about how they're sort of taking in your information. On the right hand side, I'd say platform website analytics. What I mean by that is that some web platforms have their own analytics built in as well as Google. So some people just use Google, some people use the, their actual websites analytics as well. Um, they're in, not interchangeable, but both are important. And for those that haven't um, ever experienced Google Analytics, I mean, the, the, it's, a, it's a very big, um, useful, rich source of information. And it tells you all kinds of things. There's a few screen grabs of things that it might tell you. So it's going to tell you where your users are coming from. And you can get quite a granular detail around this. Google Analytics also is free to, to install for those that don't know. So it's a, it's a free, uh, free tool um, to use. There are obviously paid for services from Google, but it, it's the basic Google Analytics tool is free. And it tells you where, for instance, whether your tra website traffic is coming from social media, whether it's coming from direct search, whether it's um, coming from referred from another website, it's going to tell you things like whether your website visitors are returning visitors or whether they're new visitors. Um, it's going to tell you stuff around their age. So you get a good sense of like what, what how, how your service is appealing to people. It will look at things like how many pages and what depth they go into. So it's a real, really useful um, tool that I think is actually still quite underused. So website developers tend to use it, but actually, um, it's a tool that's massively useful for anyone who's uh, involved in marketing and communications. And I just I think that actually uh, spending a few hours getting to, used to the tool will, will actually tell you a lot more about your audience uh, than you realise you've got. You've probably got more data about your audience than you realise. So just on this little, this is a sort of flow diagram really through a particular website and it's telling you um, which country these people are coming from. So. So up here, it's showing you that um, 11,000 from the United Kingdom. It's then telling you what their flow of, how they explored that website. So how many went to the homepage, what their next interaction was, where they went after that. And you can drill down and get more and more information. It tells you how many people jumped off the website from that page. So it really, and this is just, you know, scratching the surface. There's an awful lot of further information that it can su su supply to you. And um, that would be really helpful, I think, in terms of understanding your audience, 
your messaging and how you're how you're connecting with people online. And another thing that Google's also uh, released more recently and uh, may not be as known to people as much as uh, Google Analytics is Google Data Studio. There's a link on there. If you search Google Data Studio, you'll certainly find it. And this is really what this is a way for people to create uh, dashboards of information and it's really customizable. So it means that you can bring all the information that you're specifically interested in, in terms of how your website is working into a simple interface um, that you can then have as a sort of live dashboard, if you like, online. So you can look at it at any point. You can change the date parameters so it will bring up um, uh, data specific to a particular timeline and you can filter it by all sorts of different measures so it's, it's really 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 powerful it's a good snapshot view of what's going on online here's just one one example you can see some of the things here it's talking about number of new users page views how long people on average are staying on the site uh, whether they're on a mobile phone whether they're on a desktop uh, where they are um, so there's all sorts of information and this is just like the default one but there's lots of different dashboards that you can bring up again it's a free service uh, connect this to your website is super easy it will tell you which are the most popular bit pay, uh, pages of information on your site and so on and a lot more besides so it really is a really powerful tool and i think that um, if you get all this installed at the beginning of your project then obviously you can then harvest this for information at the end um, to really kind of um, understand what happened in your campaign so super super important the other thing, and again, some people will be very familiar with this, others less so, is that obviously the social media channels that you may well use in your campaign also have their own analytics, which again are really useful sources of free insight uh, and information in terms of how your uh, particular communications or uh, marketing campaign is going. So, and it's there's different ways to access this, and I'll give you a little glimpse at a few of them. So if you're interested, if you're using um, Instagram, you have some analytics in the app itself. If you just go to insights within the app, if it's on your phone, it will tell you um, some basic stuff around what's going on on your account and who is engaging with it. And there's also something called Create a Studio for Instagram, which is more recent. And obviously, Instagram is owned by Facebook, so it's part of the Facebook Create a Studio but it gives you more uh, insight tools into how your Instagram uh, account is performing. So I'd recommend having a look at both what's on the app itself and in Creator Studio. Just a couple of screen grabs of what that's gonna, gonna tell you, but it's gonna tell you things of, again, around which of your posts are most popular, what age people are that are engaging with them, whether they are people that follow you already or whether they're non-followers, also what types of posts are um, connecting with your audience and also when your followers are on Instagram. So I mean, this is a um, super, super important thing really. So what time you post does have an impact in terms of the success of your campaign. So that little diagram on the right hand side is giving you a view of like well, when people are on it and when they're not. Obviously you, you want to post when they are on it and not when they're not. So just a little bit of insight like that can help um tell you you know when you should be activating certain things on social media so um some of this has helped on the pre-planning of campaigns and some of it helps in terms of measuring how a campaign went again facebook similar uh, it has facebook analytics um although this is supposed to be being phased out actually this year and i think they're bringing in a new tool but again facebook already has again has creator studio where you can see how your facebook um, campaigns are performing. There's something called Facebook Insights, Facebook Ads Manager. Facebook does provide a lot of information in terms of you understanding how people are engaging with your uh, Facebook account and your Facebook posts. So super important information. Uh, again, Twitter, not quite as detailed in my opinion in terms of analytics, but it does give you quite a lot of information within the desktop uh, view of your account so once you're logged in and you can go into the insights part or the analytics part of twitter it will tell you things around how many people are in engaging what rate they're engaging uh, which are your most popular posts all of this stuff will be really helpful in terms of when you're reporting back on a particular campaign or as i say when you're planning things from the beginning so these are tools that the great thing is that they're they're free to use they're already part of these channels and um 
they actually are becoming more and more sophisticated. They're adding more and more features all the time. And so they're definitely worth exploring, getting to know. Beyond that, there are a number of other uh, specialist services that are very helpful in terms of looking at digital performance um, of campaigns and activities. There's a few on there. We're not endorse any particular one. I mean, I've used two out of the four there. Um, it's about social and Hootsuite. I've used both of those and they are very useful um, and they provide kind of visual dashboards really of, of how you perform, how you're performing. They make the scheduling of posts and, and some they do have some benchmarking options, some of them. So I'm not saying this is the only four. They are four of the sort of front runners in the market to consider. And they can make your job of uh, reporting on performance, I guess, swifter and potentially more visual in terms of um, making it very easy to drop into things like reports. If you're looking to do a, const, a, a continuous reporting on a particular project, they do make some of that easier. So they're certainly worth looking at. But I'd say if you're not doing anything around analytics, that start with the free because these are paid for accounts on there. They, often they have a free version, but they're mostly paid for. Um, but I'd start with the free analytics that um, Google provides and the social media platforms provide there. I, that's the starting point. And only when you, you're thinking, oh, there's something missing, would I then look at some of these tools to see what, where, where you might be able to plug a gap. I'm trying not to get too technical um, on, on this call, or I can take some questions uh, later on, but uh, you might have heard of pixel tracking. So pixel tracking is sometimes called uh, conversion pixels or retargeting pixels or tracking pixels. And you might be very familiar with this or it might be all, all new to you. And effectively what they are is that they are uh, one pixel by one pixel graphics that, that basically you insert onto your website. Um, and it can track the relationship between advertising on say, social media and how that interacts with your, your website. You tend to need a web developer to install the pixel, though it's super easy to do. And how you actually do that is covered really extensively, particularly Facebook is very big on tri uh, pixel tracking and uh, has lots of online guides in terms of how to do this. It's not massively complicated. The bottom line is it enables a deeper understanding of web users and how they interact with your, your marketing campaigns. So, um, there's certainly something to consider and they do give you additional information. Again, I'd start with the obvious stuff first, start with the Google Analytics, start with your social media analytics. But as you get in, into this even further and potentially people are asking deeper questions about what's going on on a particular campaign, then pixel tracking is certainly something that does provide useful information. OK, looking a bit more in terms of measuring performance. Um, so this is just kind of like a bit of a, a summary, really. So when you're looking at this, um, basically set up your campaign with measuring performance in mind. So the first little topics we covered were kind of about kind of align your campaign with your organizational objectives and then looking at things that you can actually measure and track. So if you get that right at the beginning, you set it up to do that. It makes it much easier at the end when someone then asks for a, a performance report or a summary report of how that campaign went where you can see if you can combine some qualitative and quantitative data and feedback on your campaign, see if you can get some elements of both of those, just because I think it will tell you more about actually how your audience is responding to your campaign. And it gives you that sort of personal um, people, sort of human richness to it, which I think is important. And I think a um, super important thing is, you know, act on what the results are telling you. And we'll come on a little bit in a minute in terms of what to do if your campaign isn't working. But, you know, basically, all the analytics and tools are great, but only if you listen to what they're telling you. So there's no point sort of thinking, well, oh, well, this is the best time to post. I can see that, but then post it at a different time because it's more convenient. There's no, there's no point you have to act on what the, um, the results are telling you to, to inform your next campaign. Okay, um, just a quick note on marketing return on investment, uh, ROI. It's often something that people are asked to do. And um, it's just to, to sort of shine a little bit of a light on that without kind of getting into too much kind of mathematical detail. But return on investment, obviously what we're trying to look at here is if you're spending money on marketing activity, communications activity, whether that's paid for, whether it's just staff time, is it, is it worth doing? And just to sort of say that marketing return on investment 
for not-for-profits and public sector is not always as straightforward as just a mathematical equation. It's, I'm sure it's really obvious to you, but um, if you look at the kind of bottom section of this slide, so return on market investment is the contribution to profit attributable to marketing divided by the marketing in investment. So the challenge with that is that often when you're talking about um, not-for-profit campaigns, public sector campaigns, it isn't actually about profit. Profit isn't the only driver or it isn't really something that's easy to, to measure. So the trouble is with conventional return on investment formulas is they require sales and profit. And as soon as you've got that, you can run the math. But we don't have that often in terms of this sector. So it's something we have to think about in a slightly different way. And also just to kind of, even in the charitable sector, when it is about fundraising, I just wanted to kind of talk you through, this, is, this has happened to me a few times when we've worked on charitable campaigns and people have asked about, well, was it worth doing? So it's just a little bit of a story to sort of illustrate how sometimes it is not super straightforward. So here's an example, a charity launches a fundraising campaign. So this is about money, they do, this is about bringing more money in. It costs them 10,000 pounds to do. And they raised £4,000 as a result of the campaign. Was it worth doing in terms of return on investment? The challenge here is that on a standard return on investment formula, then it wasn't worth doing. So, you know, effectively the charity um, lost money. The challenge, though, actually, in terms of reality, in terms of um, charities, not for profits, is sometimes not that straightforward. So, actually, it was worth doing, and this is kind of why. So, um, just to give an illustration, so 100 people in this campaign contributed to the £4,000 worth of donations. So that's the straightforward figure that, that directly as a result of this £10,000 investment, 4,000 people, uh, sorry, £4,000 worth of donations were generated. Now, 60, 60 of those people were one-off donators, but 40 of them went on to become direct debit regular donors uh, in the second year. And then 10 of those 40 then went on to become fund run fundraisers, and one of them left the charity um, a legacy later on when they passed away later in life. So actually, when you look at the lifetime value of those 100 people that were recruited to that campaign, it was way, way higher uh, than the initial investment that, that the charity made in terms of that campaign. So it's important to say that sometimes um, it's, just not for, it's not just a case of what that campaign generates immediately, it's the longer term value. So we have this, this um, phrase in marketing, which is the lifetime value of that interaction. So, uh, and it's really important to keep that in mind because but what, and what some charities will have if, if they are good at their sort of fundraising and marketing, they'll know that on average, that when somebody joins to make a donation, what their long-term lifetime value on average that that, that person uh, gives back to that charity. So. It's just to illustrate that sometimes simple return on investment mass doesn't consider that long-term value. And it also doesn't consider brand, what that brings into your brand. So as more and more people uh, support your initiative or follow you on social media or use your website, there is wider value than just a simple com commercial uh, transaction. So that was a long-winded long way of sort of saying return on investment is important, but there's different ways of looking at it. Um, but there's certain things that beyond this that you can measure, which I would, would urge you to have a think about. And this is what we call uh, lead acquisition costs. So um, this is quite this is quite a relatively simple thing to work out. So say you run a particular marketing or communications activity and just say the aim of it was to encourage people to sign up to an email or it was there to generate new members or followers of a particular thing. You can then work out uh, what the that what the average lead acquisition cost is. So you can take all of that marketing spend and divide it by the number of new leads, and it gives you a uh, cost, an average cost for what it costs for you to generate a new lead through this particular marketing activity. And um, that can be super useful because if you have that, if you know on average, I'm just purely speculating here, that it costs you fifteen pounds. Uh, to encourage someone to sign up to a particular activity. Then in your forecasting in the future, you can kind of work, work with that figure to say, well, look, you said to us, we need to get another 2000 members, followers, 2000 people doing something. And you can take that average acquisition cost and use that to start to put together a robust case for what you need in terms of marketing to investment to bring in those numbers. So 
Um, you may not be able to always use standard return on investment math, but you can look at lead acquisition costs. Okay, so quick, quick summary on that. Where does that leave us? So say measure everything you can, sounds super simple, but use all the analytics and tools that you've got. Look at the data you've got and try and measure as much as you possibly can. Uh, qualitative and quantitative, see if you can combine them, as I've said already. Benchmark against yourself and your peers. Don't look really to industry benchmarks. They just aren't going to be able to really tell you anything that's super useful. Use tools that are there to help you. So I've mentioned quite a few of them, uh, Google, Google Analytics, Data Studio, and so on. Use these tools. Uh, consider lifetime value. So it's not just about what this, you, you run a campaign for six months. It's not just about the engagement and the people that you reach then. It's the longer term value they have. And look at lead acquisition costs, just because I think that's going to be potentially quite powerful. Okay, so um, what about if it isn't working? So, um, uh, Libraries Connected team are particularly uh, keen for me to cover this sort of topic. So it's okay trying to measure results if the results are going in the right place and things are going well. Um, but what about if things aren't working? What do you what do you do then? You don't panic. You don't panic. It's okay. This happens. So I think the things to uh, a few sort of checkpoints really. So you've run an you've run an activity isn't working really well. So what things what what can you check? So I think often it's about taking a step back. It's about kind of going, okay, is this offer, this thing that we've presented to our audience, is it really super clear to understand? Is there anything we can do to make it uh, simpler to understand or connect with? Um, there is a bit of marketing jargon here. This how frictionless is the user experience? Frictionless is a strange word, but I think it's quite a useful shorthand to sort of say, people like to experience things as simply as possible. Um, particularly in terms of digital and online. And the trouble is often with the uh, public sector is that it can be quite multi-layered and there can be um, you know, quite a few um, steps. What, what you want? Um, I tell you. So um, what we're looking to do is, well, how can we reduce that down, keep it simple, straightforward as possible? And sometimes a fresh, fresh set of eyes can, can identify a step that can be removed. To, and I just actually, I'll give you one quick example on this. So, um, a couple of years ago, we worked on a, uh, a campaign to recruit new foster carers. It was a digital campaign and people were sent to a landing page and we were, we were recruiting people to take the first step to become foster carers. And the, we, the first stage of the campaign went OK. It wasn't great. And so we stopped, paused and thought, well, what can we do here? And what we realised is that we were asking basically people to the form that we had that was the, the basically engagement method was a was a simple form. Once we got over the kind of the sales message, if you like, there was a form to fill out. But that form was too complicated. You know, we were asking people too much um, as a first step. We were getting into too much detail, and the form was too low um, in the mix. So that's what we kind of thought. Hang on a minute, can we simplify this? Can we strip a few things out of here? And we can get to that detail late, later. Let's just try and start a conversation. Let's, you know, let's get into the detail once we know people have got some broad interest in this. And so just simplifying the form and moving the form up the page made a dramatic difference. And it was about four times higher in terms of the engagement, just from those simple actions. So the targeting was the same, the spend was the same, the channels were the same. We just, we just simplified that experience of what it was like. And we also actually, the other thing we use is the first set of data showed that most people were on a phone and we thought most people, we thought it might be about 50-50, but actually people were experiencing this campaign on a phone and filling out that form on a phone was too, too complicated. It was too many fields. So that little bit of insight and we use Google, Google Analytics and so on to identify that really made a massive difference. So run a few checks and then change something. So you might think, well, we're not quite too short to change, but let's try tweaking something. Let's change the message a little bit. Let's change the layout, like I gave the example of the form. Um, let's maybe change the time that we deliver this. Maybe this, this is something that people might be interested in in the evening. There's little, little nudges and tweaks to, the, to how a campaign can be delivered that can make um, quite a lot of difference. And then learn from those changes. So you might find that things start to get better, it might get worse, but whatever they do, learn from that and adjust from that. The other thing just as a kind of um, interesting thing I find quite useful is a, a web, it's a commercial service, but actually the answer to the public also has a free version. And um, I find it quite interesting. So it's basically a, an online listening tool. I don't know if that's how they describe it, but that's what it effectively is. 
where you can put into this search on Answer the Public any sort of search term, and it tells you what people are actually talking about this particular service or, or offer on the internet. So it combines however many searches are taking place um, uh, around the world on a particular topic. I think you can refine it uh, based on geography and so on. I don't quite know w which point you have to pay for the service and which is free. So again, it's not, I've just found it useful in the past. But you can, it can tell you quite a lot about what actually people are, what sorts of questions they're asking, and it creates some great diagrams. There's one about libraries, and it talks to you about, well, here's this one nice segment of it, like what kind of questions are people asking on the internet about libraries? So uh, this was last week, are libraries open? Are libraries free? Are our libraries open now? Are libraries open on Sundays? So it just gives you a little hint of this is, this is an accumulation of real um, website traffic. So real people asking questions um, about a particular topic. So it's something that's quite interesting. And, and the reason I include it is because if you're feeling a bit stuck, like well, I don't know where to go next, I'm not quite sure why people aren't responding to our campaign. How can we adjust it to make it more relevant? It's a tool that can give you some free, again, free insight um, in terms of what people are actually discussing and thinking about your particular topic or service. So something to consider. The other thing in terms of uh, why campaigns may not work, and this is just some common pitfalls that we've seen all of these on, uh, over our years in terms of working on campaigns. So some, sometimes multiple actions is a classic one actually, where you're actually asking people to do too many different things, but they end up not doing any of them because you're, you're saying, sign up here, watch this video, download this, do that, do that, do that. And um, actually it's not clear to them which one you, you what, what actually you want them to take and it becomes a bit, a bit confused. Um, there's too many different multiple actions that are all at the same level really. And so that can actually stop people taking any action at all. Duration of commitment is the other one. So in the example I gave you about foster carers, we were asking people to commit too early to spend too much time on something. And actually what it needs to be is a much lighter touch at the beginning. So that duration of commitment, think about how long it's actually gonna take somebody to, to, to do the thing you're asking them to do and see if you can make that uh, quicker. Too many steps is a similar, they're connected really. There's too many steps to engage people and you, people are dropping off at each of uh, an earlier stage. Um, the mobile experience, again, is a classic one. So on the libraries campaign that we ran for London, I think I'm right in saying that the no percentage of people who engaged with that campaign on mobile, I think was 88%. It was certainly in the, in the uh, high 80s. So how that campaign performed on mobile is super, super important. So, you know, think about it mobile first. Um, and the mobile experience has to be just bob on. The other thing that's a common pitfall is people ignoring their own data. So they look at something and they kind of, they look at the data, but they don't like what it really tells them. So they ignore it and do the campaign they were gonna do anyway. Um, so, and then they wonder why it didn't work. So do not ignore your own data. If you're, if you're trying to reach an audience, but you do not have any engagement with that audience on social media, your campaign is unlikely to dramatically change that. So um, look at the data you've got and base decisions based on that. The wrong channel, again, is like you're trying to reach an audience, you know, if you're trying to engage teenagers on Twitter, you know, don't bother as a simple example, you know, go to where the audience is, don't try and pull them onto a channel that isn't theirs, it's never going to work. Okay, so um, nearly there now, folks, this is about keeping, so this is about success. So you have, you're, you've managed to engage your audience uh, in whatever way and on whatever campaign. And you've now got a job, a good, more, a good job, but you've got to kind of keep that audience engaged. What are you going to do with them next? And this is a sort of some broad, some broad thoughts on this, because obviously it's very dependent on the actual campaign. But um, in terms of building and maintaining momentum, where, where do you start? So the first thing I'd say is that have a good think about how much contact do you actually need? Um, so there's no point trying to create a massive job for yourself to have loads and loads of engagement if actually people don't need that to, to, to participate in the activity that you're, you're, you're promoting. So be realistic about how much content you actually need because obviously the more contact you have, the more resource you're probably gonna to need to put behind it. And then I'd say to encourage you to, tap, to map out the touch points you might have with the audience. So where are they already? And I'll go into touch points a bit more in a second. Where are you already connecting with them in some way? And how can you potentially increase that if you need to, to keep them interested? 
And yeah, do you then need to increase the frequency of type of interaction? Um, and also have a think about what do they actually need from you? So it's okay um, thinking, well, what do we need from them? But actually, what do they need from, from you? And are, can you satisfy that need? So there's questions there, really. But in terms of the touch points, I think this is a good, good starting point. So if it's about libraries, you're where and you've got an, interest, an interested audience, um, where are they already uh, having some contact with you? And then you to map that first is a good starting point. And then you can think about, well, is that enough? Should we be doing more? Do we need to up, you know, up that or increase that? Or do we need to change it in some way in terms of the content? So if, for example, you've done a new campaign and you've brought a slightly different new audience to your, to your service, and they may well then be on your website, having another look at your website to think, well, does the information that audience is interested in, is it actually online? Do we need to bring in some new pages? If we've recruited, uh, brought in a bunch of people interested in a particular topic, we need to make sure that we're satisfying their, their interest now. Um, it might be that it's about what's going on in the actual physical library environment. It might be looking at your social media content and whether that's enough and whether you're on the right channels. E news there, so it's, it's a starting point really is to, to, to work out what that um, user journey is or what that uh, engagement journey is already before you then start to change it or bring in additional things. That's always a good starting point. And then in terms of engaging, sorry, to, to building that engagement and increasing it, you know, there's lots of different things to try and it's going to be dependent on uh, what it is that you're trying to achieve. So um, I mentioned sign up for e-updates, that might be something. You look. You could look at polls or questionnaires on social media. Some brands have done really, really well on that in terms of not just seeing social media as a broadcast. You know, it shouldn't really be just something you just chuck out to people. It should also be a place where people can um, have some level of interaction. And so whether that's about social media polls or asking questions of your audience to have some dialogue, that might be something that you can help keep that momentum going. It could be about competitions. Um, and that might be about crowdsource content or asking your audience for feedback and create a competition around that. So slightly just different, nothing that's too intensive, but things that will um, encourage more interaction with that audience rather than just giving them information. It's about, I guess, creating a reason for them to come back to you. And it might be that you can incentivize uh, that in some way um, uh, to encourage that sort of interaction. You might be able to link it to existing events. I know the library services do this really, really well. It's looking what's coming up in the um, in the diary in terms of popular awareness weeks or awareness days and linking in with that activity. And also, you know, I think what some charities particularly do really well is they thank people for their engagement and their support. And it could, that's no reason the public sector can't do that as well. And that's some, sometimes that simple thank you does actually really help reinforce the relationship and the bond between uh, an audience and a particular organisation. So never wouldn't be afraid to say thank you to your audience for, for whether that's following them or engaging in their campaign or responding in some way. So just to wrap up now, um, it's a bit of a recap, I'm conscious there's lots of information there, but in essence, the, let's keep it simple. So in terms of tracking the performance of your campaign, first off, there's sort of six steps to this really. Set your campaign overarching objectives and those that we said before should be linked into what your organization is all about, what's trying to achieve. Set your marketing campaign goals and make sure that they are smart ones, some things that you can measure, that they're realistic, that you know how you can measure them. Um, and then explore and decide what you can and, can and can't measure, how you're gonna measure it. Um, and that will bring in things like, uh, Google Analytics and social media analytics, make sure you've got that set up at the beginning so that once you need to report at the end of the project, you know what you're looking at and it's all set up and in place. And decide how often you will review and report. So, you know, you may well have live dashboards, but it's not, it's not gonna be the sort of thing you want to report on all of the time. So you might decide that you're going to report back on a few key things um, every four to six weeks for example, or it might be um, you know, every three months if it's a much longer activity, but set that out, set yourself a market to sort of say, right, we're gonna review this at this point against the same parameters so we can actually compare and contrast where we were. Create your own benchmarking data set, as I said already, you know, benchmark it against yourself and learn from what works. 
Um, and then review results and adaptive media. Don't panic if you do need to adapt. It's quite common that you know, not everything is going to work. The important thing is how do you adapt based on what works and what doesn't uh, to inform the next project or campaign. And that, in, a, in, an, in essence, is um, some hopefully some useful information in terms of how you can go about measuring the performance of your campaign and reporting back on it to, to your team, uh, to other people in your organisation. I'm going to stop sharing now so I can see people, which will be nice. And I'm happy to uh, to take any questions or look look in the I can look in the chat. I was going to have a colleague with me today, but unfortunately she's um, pulled away on uh, some urgent family business, so I haven't been able. To, I'm flying solo, so if it takes me slightly longer to get to questions, that'll be the reason. We had a we had a few questions earlier that that might have been cleared up in the chat themselves actually about when you were when you were talking about analytics. Um, just mainly about um, how to whether, whether it needs installing, which I, I, which it, 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 uh, so I'm just I'm just scrolling back through the. Yeah. Um, so I can see one here actually. Thanks, thanks, um, Edward. I can see one. Can you use Google Analytics on a website not not hosted by them? Yes, you can. So um, Google Analytics is, is simple to explore. Uh, sorry, explore, simple to install. And it can be installed on any on a website, so it's nothing to do with Google's hosting. It's a service that they run, so uh, we don't host any of our websites on, on Google. We use analytics on all of our our websites. And um, your web, I mean, your web development agency, if you're using an agency, will be very familiar this with this and be able to install it for you. And if it's hosted by the local authority, again, somebody within that local authority. Um, well, I would be amazed if they didn't have analytics installed. It's just they probably haven't thought that actually you might need to look at it. Um, so, for instance, if we're running a, a website project, we'll maybe have ourselves, the clients we're working for, and a few other people with all, all the same access. They can see what's going on. Just scooting through. People talking about um, installing it. So basically, you, in terms of looking at the analytics, you're effectively looking at a web page that is bringing in a summary of those analytics. So it's not like the same as installing a piece of new software. So in most cases, um, we've worked with quite a few council services, you can still view the analytics. It's not as if you need to install a particular piece of software. I'm just going through. Oh, someone's answered that for me. Thank you, whoever that was. <laughs> and okay. Um, okay. Is ah oh, here's a it's a question. about hashtags, tracking hashtag usage. Is there a free tool to track hashtag usage? Uh, it's a good question. I believe there is. I've used a, a free tool that enables you to um, define which are the most popular hashtags under a particular topic. So I will try and find that and put that into the chat for the end of this conversation. Um, which is basically enables you to kind of say, well, we're interested in, I don't know, um, running a, an environmental campaign, just as an example. And you can put that topic in and it will identify uh, the most popular hashtags that people are using to connect together on that particular topic. So you can use that. And I believe the same tool has got kind of um, parameters around uh how many people are using that hashtag i think beyond that you would have to go into the individual uh, social media channel so for example you can follow hashtags uh, uh, using instagram as an example you can follow people who are using that hashtag you can search under a particular hashtag and see see how it's going there probably is an aggregator that brings that all together that isn't something i've used but others may well have done it's probably imagine what you tend to find is that um, on digital, there are there's usually someone who's got a got a tool for the job. The question is whether there's a paywall in front of it to be able to use it. So that's anything I, I, could, I couldn't advise on without looking into it a little bit further. Uh, 
happy to take um, questions verbally if people want to want to talk as well. That's fine now. Although I don't know if Edward, you need to let people uh, unmute. I'm not sure how it works. I think you. Hello. Oh, there we go. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm Katie from Barn Library. I had a question about um, sort of tips reaching um, to an audience who don't really use social media and computers in um, and, and in the loneliness initiative to sort of reach older people um, who are hard to kind of contact in the first place. Mm. Um, do we sort of, um, I think the idea that I had when you were talking about who were sort of um, interacting with in that sense is to be asking the people if they have people who are at risk of that, but what would you suggest in that sort of area? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, I guess in terms of trying to, I guess the, the question is a bit broad in the sense of how do you reach an audience? How, how do you know how to reach an audience you're not already engaged with? I guess yeah. That's, 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 that's so, um, and, uh, there might be some people on from the library network that we're currently working with at the moment which was looking to uh target younger people so it's, it's, a, it's a different challenge you've got there but it's the same thing where they're trying to reach an audience they don't really reach now mm. so how, how do we go about that and um and that was a kind of 13 to 19 18 year olds really and so what we ended up doing for them and with them is we recruited some people we used a recruitment service to recruit some young people and actually talk to them about library services talk to them about how they communicate with their friends how do they find out what's going on in their area and you know why they don't engage with libraries um and you know that was really telling so you know in a way it's not a surprise but it was really powerful in the sense that their the communications channels that they are using are different to what library services are using so you know we you, they weren't going to reach them on their the channels that they're currently using and they had a particular perception about library services so basically by talking to them directly we got a real richness there about well how can we now in the future uh, reach that audience Mm. Um, so I think sometimes it does come down to a bit of that kind of level of research because you're right you, if you if those those people aren't on uh, aren't currently um using you know websites and social media there's no point trying to reach them through websites and social media to talk to them about why they're not engaged on websites and social media it's a kind of a, a circle really so um you know reaching those people through other methods so that's either, you know, I'd basically I'd try and get a conversation going with some of those, those people and that the recruitment, there's different recruitment methods. You can either use a professional recruitment service or, as you say, you could use young people to try and um, contact, reach out to those people to have a conversation. Because I think in that case, it's a whole new market and there's no, nothing's going to replace actually having a, a conversation about that. So that goes back to that sort of qualitative research around, you know, let's have some human interaction, find out about it. Um, because it might well be that in that in that for those people that there is a communications channel it's just not what you might expect you know um every, you know there's often quirks so for example you know where i live there's a particular sort of free trade magazine that comes through the door you know quite old school but it is the thing that kind of lots and lots of people see you know it's non-digital it's quite old-fashioned in a way but it's one of the best ways to connect with a particular group of people um, and only by talking to them you find out what that thing is. So oh, that's, a bit. And that's brilliant. No, thank you very much. It's given me um, uh, more ideas. Um, okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Anybody else? Let's have another look at the, the chat as well, see if there's anything there to bear with me. Um, Chris, can I yeah. ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. It's Pork from Hertfordshire Libraries. Hello. Two slightly related questions. The first one is, what are your thoughts on what's the right number of posts, you know, for our individual library Facebook pages? You know, how would we go about trying to assess that? And the second question is, um, because I'm not very close to this, is how meaningful is the measurement of Facebook reaches? reaches okay that's right thank you yeah, yeah, yeah. okay two big two good questions I'll do, I'll do my bestest 
Um, okay, frequency is frequency is. I, I guess it depends on the. It does depend on the channel. So I think that. Um, and the di different cha social channels kind of have different purposes, I would say. So, for example, I think people are more used to Twitter, as an example, being quite a, quite a very regular stream of information. You know, it's kind of micro news is their sort of uh, focus, really. So actually, um, you will find that some sort of Twitter streams are very, very active and have multiple, multiple posts um, a day and actually despite that the engagement rate is still pretty good because people are kind of used to that level of frequency and as long as the content is is always good then it doesn't seem to drop off you know it still seems to maintain that level um instagram on the other, other hand what we've found and it's again different brands are different but in, in general i'm talking quite in general terms that actually pacing out the, um, the posts is a better thing to do. That actually, if you post lots and lots of posts on the Instagram feed, actually the percentage of engagement seems to drop, you know, per post. So it, you, it's good to be regular, but not to overdo it. You can easily oversaturate it, and it actually, it's better to kind of be a bit more paced. In terms of um, Facebook, it's probably somewhere, you know, somewhere in the middle. I mean, I think I think the critical thing with all of it is like, is the content good? is it relevant you know that's the, that's the that has to be the driver and so what that tends to mean is that sometimes um it ebbs and flows so i think actually if you've got something to say you've got a campaign and there's lots of good content coming out of it you can create a bit of a momentum through regular posting that people kind of get get used to i think those feeds that just seem to be very systematic regardless of their me their message whether the content is good or the ones that start to come a cropper eventually because people basically just switch off from the from the content so you know i would say if you were posting on facebook every day that's good going um, but i wouldn't overly overly stress about it and i think the other thing to do is to try and you, you can easily see if the engagement rate drops if you increase so say you had the capacity to do more you know, you could try that for a short period of time um, and compare it compared to if you didn't. And you'll be able to sort of see whether actually it was worth that investment. Because obviously any sort of posting takes an investment of time, even if you're using some, some tools to help and make it a bit more systematic. But um, it's not a clear cut answer, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a steer. I think in terms of reach, uh, reach is something that I am less interested. I'm really interested in what people are doing with that information. So I would look at engagements really. So whether that's engagements in terms of likes, shares, um, uh, comments, that's the stuff and click throughs. That's all good stuff. Right? That is somebody who's seen something and reacted in some way. Hopefully it's not a negative reaction, but you know, they've reacted to your information in some way reach is easy to buy but it doesn't really necessarily mean that much and it's very hard to to kind of prove what it means but if somebody's taken an action any sort of action then that is real and something that i'm much more interested in really super helpful if there's a moment i might ask a further question but i'll shut up for a moment yeah no of course i can see is it i hope i'm getting this in the right order michelle i think you're Hi. Um, I, yeah, I think actually you may just have been um, touching on that because we're often asked from funders and from Libraries Connected to actually give measures of our digital engagement. There doesn't seem to be like um, a standard count for that. Are you saying that when we're talking about engagements, it's those things about action? Are there standard counts? Are we counting views, etc.? Yeah. If that makes any sense. Sorry. It's just knowing how to report, because even when the Arts Council will say we want you to prove digital engagement, what counts as best to prove digital yeah. engagement? Yeah, OK. Um, so, again, it's a good question. It's slightly, want to make it overly complicated, but it's slightly dependent on the, or it's slightly dependent on the channel. Yeah. And it's also dependent on your, what you set up as a campaign objective. So, because the trouble is, is what you can then measure changes dependent on that. But effectively, you know what we focus on um is engagements as we say was a combination of uh likes shares comments 
you know, and that can be that's the same for Instagram and Facebook. I know they do it in a different way, but it basically means means a similar sort of thing. And also views, because the thing is, is that views are separate because, for example, somebody might view a video and mm. may not like it, but it doesn't mean they didn't like the video. Because again, going back to my thing, you, you're asking people to do two things. So what you'll often find if you do a video campaign is the views will be really good and the likes will be really low, but it doesn't mean they didn't like the video. And this is where it gets a bit like... Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sends you a bit yeah. crazy trying to think, well, yeah, because maybe they did like that, yeah. but I can't say that, so should I be doing it? Yeah. yeah. The views matter because basically that is the app, that's the primary action is the view. You know, uh, a bonus if they like it, but it's about a view. And in most analytics tools, you can also get into, if you want to, uh, the depth of depth of that view so you, you it will count things like a view beyond three seconds and stuff like that so the, the yeah. danger with views is that sometimes it's like someone's literally just you know watched a second and disappeared so most of the analytics will have a kind of uh, i don't know if it's three seconds or five seconds now but they'll have a measure for actually sort of the, the depth of in, engagement of a, of a view if you like okay. so yeah I, I would look at those i'd look at views um engagement and certainly click throughs if it's a if it's that sort of campaign, not everything is, but if it's a campaign where you're trying to direct people somewhere else mm-hmm. and, you get, and you get them there, then that is that is a d- deeper level of engagement, really. Uh, but what about the, websites? Sorry, sorry, I interrupted them. No, no, go on. Yeah. When you say websites, which which aspect, how, how do you mean? Just... I'm actually reporting, reporting on engagement with your websites. Okay, so I would go for page views, definitely. Mm-hmm. And you and... Uh, unique visitors ah yeah okay so because the page views is effectively that's a combination so say that say you know that the, the hundred or hundred people on this webinar went to the to the website that's that's 100 unique visitors but we might have explored 400 pages between us so you need both mm-hmm. you need both measures you need the number of people that you got somewhere but then what did they do when they got there right, so the combination yeah. of um unique uh sorry unique visitors and a number of page views is, is the key thing the thing about um so i just get too granular about it but a lot of people get really freaked out about bounce rates and think it's a terrible thing um and i just a quick word of warning on that so bounce rate for those that don't know is kind of a percentage that the website gives you for the number of people who've only visited one page and then left and it's considered to be a bounce rate and people often battle on to try and reduce the bounce rate i'm not saying sometimes that's the right thing to do but the thing is a good website will send people to the information they want as quickly as possible. And it may well be on that page. And so the fact they didn't go anywhere else may actually be a benefit, not a negative. So just be careful if people start obsessing about uh, bounce rates, because actually we try to build websites where people go to where they want, don't have to go around. So actually it's actually a measure of success. So uh, just a quick one on that, because it, it's a bugbear. <laughs> Thank you. Good gosh, good questions. Um, I'll just quickly. Someone's put a nice, looks like a good uh, tool in the chat there. Thank you. I don't know that one, so I'll have a look at that one. Uh, see. I've seen quite a good question from, um, from Karen about um, uh, Facebook video analytics um, uh, about uh, how, about the um, what what would you say was more meaningful uh, three second video views fifteen second video views or, or one minute video views um, that, that's a um, question yeah so yeah it's it's hard this isn't it okay so I mean I think you know obviously it's slightly dependent on the length of the video in its entirety um, um, but I mean I think say you had say you had a uh, a a two minute video and someone's watching three seconds it's unlikely that they've they've had a great time and you know it's not they've obviously gone on to it and it's, that's not a video for them so i'd certainly say the longer the duration um then the more valuable or uh, the le- deeper level of engagement that that um has had that said the only thing to to watch is say you have something that's a promotional film say it's two and a half minutes long um but that actually it, it delivers the main message quite quickly within it and actually advertises where people can go for more information. There is a chance that someone's gone, actually, I do want, I do want to find out more about that. And they've gone off and they've done the thing that you want them to do. So it's not always de- 
necessarily that they didn't like what they were they were watching. You may well have done the job and they wanted to go and find out more. But I would say in general, if somebody's only um, watching, you know, 10% of your video content, it's hard to put that down as a very positive uh, engagement measure, if I'm absolutely honest. But it does depend on the length of the actual thing. So it's hard to be specific for everybody. Thanks for the question though. Yeah, and thanks Claire for your note about, yeah, people scrolling down on auto play videos, you're right. Actually, it might just be capturing that, that interaction. Um, from Parikh. Um, oh, Parikh, yeah, I can see you now. Go for it, Parikh. Thanks, Chris. Uh, it's just really interesting following the thread on uh, services using different platforms. Um, so it seems to be predominantly Facebook. Based upon you know, your perception of library services and the audiences that we've traditionally reached and the ones we're trying to reach, for example, um, younger, uh, for example, 18 to 24 year olds, for example, uh, or young parents, do you have any views on you know, Instagram versus TikTok versus Twitter versus Facebook? Sure. And this, so did you say 18 to 24? Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Okay, I do actually. Um, some relatively fresh sort of insight as well, having just talked to a bunch of them about library services of, of that age group. Um, so, unsurprisingly, uh, we are in the, the era of the rise of TikTok, um, and its rise has been quite quite dramatic, and um, particularly for the younger end. Um, so your early teens through to probably your twenties, TikTok is, is becoming a massive platform and is i mean i don't know whether it's going to flatten off the curve but at the moment it, it doesn't seem to be um t t uh, facebook for that audience is is pretty dead if i'm honest um so uh facebook is very popular in an older demographic but 18 to 24s they they'll say that the challenge is they'll say they use it but actually what they're doing is they're using facebook messenger they're not actually necessarily using Facebook in the conventional, what you might be using Facebook for in terms of reach. So it is, it is dropping off a cliff uh, for younger people, Facebook, um, and Twitter's already not, not really an engagement platform for them. So if I were doing a campaign for 18 to 24 year olds tomorrow, I would use Instagram and TikTok um, without any hesitation, really, to be honest. And um, if I was going even younger than the, your, your demographic, then Instagram becomes questionable because I think, um, you know, TikTok and it's got real pro uh, prominence there. And I think the other thing that, um, and I don't have the statistics in my head, but also what's, what's happening is a massive rise in uh, video um, in all its different variations. So obviously TikTok is a video platform, but also Instagram is increasingly focused in on Instagram reels and video stories and uh, the rise of Instagram video is quite quite dramatic in the last couple of years whether that's a response to TikTok or not, I don't know um, so you've got a kind of shift in terms of channel but you've also got a shift in terms of format uh, towards more video based content which presents challenges you know it's not easy that to satisfy and, and you've also got the added thing without trying to throw spanners in with um with TikTok that it's a relatively uh, immature format for advertising, like it's not like as anywhere near as developed the advertising potential compared to um, Facebook and Instagram, We've obviously got very, very sophisticated advertising engines and very, very sophisticated targeting and all of that stuff. Uh, TikTok advertising obviously exists and, and, and it's being rolled out quite fast, but my understanding is it's not as, it's not a sophisticated a platform yet because it's a lot younger. Um, and I don't know as well about whether, um, what kind of payment payment levels, how to actually have any real strong engagement on TikTok. I'm not quite sure on the, on the, on the metrics of it yet. I'm much more familiar in terms of advertising point of view with Facebook and Instagram. Um, and also just in terms of, um, just a little, get a little bit of insight to share because it was libraries connected campaign so I can, I can share this so we did a campaign for London libraries recently for libraries connected 
using um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as the three main channels. And it was about a kind of campaign to encourage people back into the library and talked about the benefits of libraries. And uh, Instagram outperformed the other two channels about three to one. Um, I mean, I say it's only one campaign, but it's just a, it's a relatively recent thing. So I just thought I'd share that. Thank you, really super helpful, thank you. Yeah, someone's talking about here, I'm just looking in the chat about, uh, hang on, it's moving quite fast, hang on. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. It's about reposting TikTok on Reels, yeah, a lot of that, so there's a lot of, um, uh, yeah, a lot, of, you're right, a lot of people are seeing TikTok video content on Instagram, people are reposting it, very, very common thing that's happening at the moment, you're absolutely right. Uh, Okay, people talk about email. Yeah, interesting one in terms of e email. So um, that's interesting one as well, just in terms of particularly in terms of younger people. So it's harder to engage with younger people on, on email. E email is not as commonly used um, by young people. They expect a lot of the information to be activated on social media and, and all that engagement to happen on social media rather than on going to their email older sorry, older organizers uh organizations sorry older people um do use email a lot um someone saying students don't read emails which is a yeah it's, <laughs> it's a bit of a worry um but it is a hard one i think you definitely see divisions in terms of age and channels which is i think becoming more stark or maybe i'm just getting older but i'm definitely getting older so but you suddenly see it becoming more stark uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, just flicking through if there's anything else. I think one thing actually, just picking up on um, I think it's Carrie's point about whether they have access to their own accounts and so on. But in terms of one thing I'd urge you to do is that if obviously you, are, you may well be working as part of a bigger service and that you're not necessarily having access to um, the analytics and the channels that you'd need. I do think that's important to try and address that because Without that information, you, 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 it's very hard to make the right decisions around what you should be doing and where you should be putting your efforts. So it is quite easy to give other people access. And if you can't get access, then you know, obviously you can, you can ask for regular reports. Um, and depending on the channel, there's a way to set up automated reports. So at least you can start to learn from actually what is really going on on your accounts rather than just relying on it sort of secondhand. So yeah, without that sort of analytics data, without what's going on in your social, uh, but getting a little bit behind the scenes, it is hard to learn. And the, the thing about comms and marketing and about this seminar particularly is learn from what's actually going on is the best way you can guarantee you're gonna be more successful in the future. Without that, you are literally going blind into the next campaign without that information. And as I said, it's not about spending loads of money on market research. The brilliant thing is a lot of this data exists and is there for free, but you need to get access to it. It was a good question there, hang on a sec. When running a campaign, would you recommend posting the same posts in various formats in all of the social media channels? Um, that's a good question. I need to have a think about that actually. I mean, I think in, in, in general, it, it's relatively easy uh, to tweak and adjust a post to work on a different channel. So obviously you can't turn a still image into a video image, you know, you need to think about some practicalities around that. I think, but most of the time you can go from, um, certainly from Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, you, it's quite easy to adapt um, a post uh, to make it work on all those three channels uh, we'll often start with really simple like a spreadsheet where we'll have like this is this is the information we want to get across and this is you know this is the image that goes with it and so on and then we'll have a different adaption version in each of the spreadsheet cells so it's ready to upload to all three quite quickly obviously it's watching things like the handles so if you're mentioning people obviously they might have a different address on each channel so simple mistakes like that do irritate users if you end up putting an instagram uh, address in a Twitter post and all that kind of thing. It just looks a bit, it looks a bit messy. So it does take a little bit longer. 
um, and they do have a slightly different tone sometimes. You you know you'll have noticed that from your own channels. You have a slightly different tone. You obviously have much more length if you're using something on Instagram or or Facebook. But I would say if you get the core thing right, it's relatively easy to adjust. And also, you know, you need to be practical. You need to make this relatively easy on yourself. If you're having to create three completely different things for th different channels, it's a massive investment of time. So I'm all for kind of making it easy on yourself, but just avoid any common pitfalls, really, in terms of that. And just, um, you know, if the content's good and relevant, I think it's fine. And most people, if they see something on two channels, are not going to be that worried about it. And also, even if somebody follows you on those channels, doesn't necessarily see they see all the information. The trouble now with social is that, Obviously, it's a bit of a, can be a bit of a sea of information. And so actually, you can't presume that people have seen it anyway. I've uh, got something from Karen here. Let me just, sorry, just quickly read this one, conscious of time. Just one session. Yeah, okay, Karen, just to say, yeah, that sounds good. Karen's talking about running a, a digital uh, social media campaign for a few months. Uh, but posting at slightly different times of the day and tweaking the tone slightly to get the right message across. That sounds like a good idea to me. Yeah, that sounds great. I think it's that thing actually, there's a comment here. Uh, yeah, it's thinking about who's following you. So as I said, if you're trying to reach young people but you only use Twitter and you know young people aren't on it, you know, it, it's not gonna work. You've gotta go where that market is. So if you're trying to bring in new people, there's no point just slogging away on your same channels in the hope that they're gonna come and find you, they won't. You know, why would they? There's no reason to. Uh, you need to go where they are, not expect them to come to you. Um, easier said than done, but that's just that's just the truth of it, really. 